We managed to break through the door, but they were ready. I'm injured. I was lucky to make it out alive. Garris, it'll have to be you.
I rise tonight to address a matter of great urgency to our nation's security. The judgment of the Right Honorable Smythe across from me at the dispatch box. It is with sincere conviction that I must propose a motion to declare them an enemy of the state. I must ask the House, what evidence is there to support this motion? Let us hear it. Evidence? 
Their treachery is common knowledge. Who here isn't privy to the exploits of the Right Honorable Smythe in the opposition? It is with their support that this rebellion has brought London to its knees. The idea that Camelot could succeed without one of our own is inconceivable. The blame for this catastrophic turn of events, therefore, is on them and them alone. What evidence do you have in your defense? It's settled, then. All those opposed to the motion, please say nay. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. The motion is carried. Punishment. Death. Oh, look. I'm 
I tried abandoning you to the wastes. I tried having you killed. I had you tried and convicted. Despite my best efforts, you remain to the bitter end. So let's talk. That's a very open-ended question. What exactly are you demanding I take accountability for? The experiments that gave you life, that pushed the scientific frontier further than ever before in human history? It's a matter of perspective. The benefit of my experiments, private and public, far outweigh the social cost. When you're victim to that social cost, it will blind you. It will be all you care about. That's understandable. But when looking at the situation objectively, you would see nothing but the efficient allocation of resources. If you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. A world of Smythe shaped by Smythe. That's what I believe in. Power isn't held in symbols, but in people. Having the right person in the right place at the right time means everything. I am that person, and this is the place, and this was the time. You may think that's incorrect, but it's what I believe. 
surely you're not referring to Camelot. The world burned under the watch of democracy. I wonder how long it will be before it burns again under Arthur's quaint little regime. I am Smythe, Mr. Smythe. I've never lied to you in that regard. If you counted up my lifetimes, I'd be about 200, give or take a few decades. I stopped counting. I was born in what is now known as Eastminster, before the Blast Wall Initiative. I worked for the government in the Ministry of Information. That is where Angel grew its wings. I made that ministry my own, even after I was imprisoned for my activities. It was still under my thumb. I spent the last few years writing letters about the coming war to the Prime Minister, the Cabinet, the Opposition, the President, everyone. They were all ignored. There was naught I could do from my cell, and Angel was only in infancy. So on the 23rd of October, 2077, the world ended. I was imprisoned right up until the last day, exactly where I wanted to be. I was ready. My escape was immaculate, every last detail flawless. The Ministry of Information had been building our own Pindar bunker for years. From there, I watched the world burn. The bunker in question is, of course, the one beneath the Angel Underground Station. We are the same. Any difference between us is derived from our experiences and scientific error. Had things gone differently, they would be running the country. You must understand, I respect the parliamentary and legislative process. It's the people within the process that made it fail. So, I compromised. Yes, you would be my replacement before this sorry state of affairs, had you completed conditioning. A clone of a clone of a clone, etc. I am long since removed from the original Smythe, yet feel exactly what he felt, and remember exactly what he lived through. If you had finished conditioning, you would be exactly the same in body and mind as the man who walked these lands before Doomsday struck. The only man who saw it coming, whose warnings, had they been heeded, would have quite literally saved the world. The theatrics are over. Quite frankly, it would serve no purpose to deceive you any longer. Oh, I agree. I'm not surprised you turned out the way you did. Thrown into that cesspool with none of my wisdom. Anyone, even me, would struggle to rise above it. Very well. Let's finish this. Isn't it obvious? You brought an end to my world. Now I shall bring an end to yours.
surpassing the expectations of their creator. The Wayfarer had ultimately swayed the course of history. Arthur, true to his word, began the process of establishing a true representative democracy. For better or worse, the fate of London would be tied to the will of the people. Camelot continued to fight the enemies of democracy wherever they found them, ensuring fair and free elections in the region. Falling to their demise, the final seconds of Smy's life were spent watching their replacement shrink into the distance. He considered the events leading up to this moment and all the ways such a fate could have been avoided. However, in some small part, it came as a relief. Passing the torch had always been part of the plan, and now his job was done. The future was no longer his burden to carry. The Wayfarer, remembered as Geheris in the new Legend of the Round Table, was honored for generations to come. Not as an individual, but as a part of something greater. The Tommies continued to report to the government with a new charter outlining their role in a true democratic society. With Pete Davies at the helm, the Roundhouse rebounded. After cleaning up the few straggling hooligans, their club sprang back to life, though it came a party, because thanks to a newly, mostly sober Davies. The Pistols of Camden embraced the future with cautious optimism. While life in Camden didn't change all that much, the rest of London adopting a way of life similar to their own was reassuring. Following the Battle of Westminster, the Camden Council discussed the Wayfarer's actions in depth. The Wayfarer was declared an honorary member of the Council for their involvement in the uprising. For the time being, Miller's men were left alone. They were deemed too much of a hassle to deal with, and Islington was blockaded. While they would occasionally sneak out and attack neighboring boroughs, their rage, for the most part, turned inwards. With no outlet for their fury, this spawned a culture of infighting. Gangs of Miller's men would beat each other to the death of a trivial matters. Fortunes were lost and won at a swing of a fist. Only one thing united them, their devotion to their leader, Miller. Traders came and went, but the Croydonians rarely crossed the bridge that had been built for them. They regarded the rest of the world with disinterest, and they were better off for it. The Tommies never returned to Brickton, and their independence was guaranteed for years to come. They became a safe haven for those in London seeking a simpler life. In the grand scheme of things, they were insignificant, and they wouldn't have it any other way. While the rest of the city marched on, Brickton remained a capsule in time. Change was slow in Eastminster following the fall of the gentry. The Good Samaritans were instrumental in keeping a semblance of order through the chaos. With their newfound autonomy, the flame of community spirit burned brighter than ever. The free and fair elections were not kind to the gentry, who failed to form a majority in the subsequent parliament. As time went on, the law no longer turned a blind eye to their extractive policies. This financial shock caused a significant decline in the Westminster surplus. Now on equal legislative footing with the rest of London, the gentry redirected considerable resources 
into lobbying for their interests. This investment would ensure they retain their economic dominance. The Vagabonds surged in strength under their popular leader, gaining wide control over East London. For those that were part of Sebastian Gaunt's growing cult following, it was a golden time. For those who were formerly with the Syndicate, or suspected of being so, dark and bloody days would come. The Thames folk disappearances, thanks to the Wayfarer's efforts, slowed, but they did not cease entirely. They would remain isolated in enclaves, forever looking behind their backs. Archie, like many young men, struggled to find his place in old Blighty. Never truly at home, he wandered the waste searching for a place to hang his head. He saw the world, or what was left of it. But always traded a comfortable bed for a new horizon every chance he got. Kira continued her pursuit of treasure through the capital, always seeking greater and more daring gains. But though riches greased her palms, it was never enough. And so, she decided to leave London, endeavoring to explore beyond the capital. Her new quest is to become the most famed adventurer in the world. And so, the Wayfarer's journey came to an end. But it was not the end of history, only the beginning. Because in mankind's pursuit of power, there is no price too high, no life too valuable, and no ideal too sacred. Because war, war never changes. <laughs>